Welcome to the Business in Colour podcast with Devon Sartner. We are women of colour, our passion is diversity, and we thrive on conversations that lead to action. So we decided to bring you these discussions with culturally diverse leaders and allies who share stories of their journey to a more diverse workplace. They speak from the heart. They are leaders who are committed to making a difference. We know that these stories will inspire you to lead your own conversations and spark action on diversity in your business and in your life. If you enjoy listening to the Business in Colour podcast, please leave us a review and share with your tribe. Welcome to Season 2 of Business in Colour. Since our launch in late 2020, we have had some amazing feedback from you, our supporters. You have sent us emails messaged us on LinkedIn or called us. What we have loved hearing is that the stories our guests have shared has made a difference to you, knowing that there are others with similar experiences, that there are many leaders who are working in and constantly striving for diverse workplaces does make a difference. We have lined up exceptional guests for you in season two, leaders who share their journeys candidly and honestly. Div and I want to thank you for your continued support. We would love you to like, subscribe and share this podcast with your tribe. And to kick off season two, 2021, I'm going to hand over to Div to introduce our guest. Thank you for tuning in to the Business in Colour podcast with Div and Sadhana. Our conversation today is with the Honourable Philip Dalidakis, former member of the Victorian Parliament. Philip is currently the director with the Center for Asia Pacific Strategy and non-executive director at Impact for Women, a volunteer charity working to make a difference to women and children fleeing extreme violence at home. I met Philip in 2018 when I messaged him on LinkedIn to speak at one of our events for culturally diverse women and he said yes within minutes. He has since been a strong advocate for me and my work and a strong advocate for multiculturalism in business. In this podcast, we talk about many things, about his upbringing, his cultural heritage, his entry into politics, intersectional diversity, the controversy around Australia Day and First Nations people, our constitution being rewritten, and learnings from New Zealand, and more. What I loved about this conversation is that it was true to Philip, who I now proudly call my friend. He is unafraid to challenge the status quo. He is unafraid to say what needs to be said, and he fights hard to address inequity wherever he is. Join us in listening to him in this warm, funny, genuine conversation. And tune in to one of his core beliefs that bias is learned and can be unlearned. I hope you enjoy it as much as we did. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Business in Colour podcast with myself, Div, and Sadhana. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay our respects to elders past, present, and emerging. Our guest today is, I'm very excited, the Honourable Philip Dalidakis, who I met when he was a member of the Victorian Parliament. He served as a Minister for Trade and Investment, Innovation, the Digital Economy and Small Business. And since then, Philip has gone on to hold a corporate role at Australia Post and now holds several directorships, which we'll get into in this interview never shy to speak his mind, and a public advocate for multiculturalism. Welcome, Philip Dalidakis. Wonderful to have you with us. Thank you very much, Div, for having me, and uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, be your guest. Beautiful. Now, to loop Sadhana in, Sadhana and you actually were in one of my lineups as guest speakers for our Culturally Diverse Women's Masterclass. So you actually you know, followed each other in a, in a lineup of my speakers. And beautifully, both of you cancelled your prior engagements to come and support me in 2018. So we've kind of got the gang back together, I think, <laughs> the three of us. And I wanted to dive right in, Philip, because what uh, we share in common, Sadhana, you and I, is that we come from a migrant family and we migrants ourselves. 
And I want to ask you in this first question to just take us back to your growing up years. I know you've spoken about your father who's Greek and your mother who's Jewish. We are very um, glad on this podcast to be listening in already in the live recording. Take us back a little bit and tell us what it was like <clears throat> to grow up and how did you find your way to belong in Australia? Well, it's a, it's a fascinating question because uh, growing up, I wasn't brought up Jewish. Uh, of course, mum has obviously both a religious and a Jewish cultural upbringing, although uh, fair to say doesn't practice her Judaism. And similarly, dad, uh, obviously coming from a Greek Orthodox family, but also didn't practice Greek Orthodox from a religious perspective. So uh, growing up, I neither had access to Judaism or Greek Orthodoxy from a religious perspective, mm -hmm. but certainly was brought up both with a Jewish and a Greek identity. In fact, some of my earliest memories are being taken along to Greek nights uh, where dad had been the secretary, the president, the treasurer, sometimes all three at the same time of a group called the Greek Panathesalian Greek Brotherhood. And so, you know, lamb on the spits, Greek dancers, uh, when I was younger, Greek language lessons uh, were always uh, part of growing up. And in fact, uh, I'll just uh, digress because one of my earliest memories was not dissimilar to a scene from The Wog Boy. If, uh, <laughs> if those people that have seen the film remember, uh, Nick Giannopoulos, I think it is in his character, remembers being back to uh, a student in the schoolyard where he opens his lunches and he pulls out his tzatziki and his cucumber and his pitta. <laughs> and there's this like little redhead ginger megs type uh, Australian boy poking his finger at him going, wong boy, wong boy. And he said all he dreamed was of a Vegemite sandwich, right? And, you know, growing up, all I wanted was a bloody peanut, sam peanut butter sandwich and a bloody Vegemite sandwich as well. And, and so they're my earliest memories. But countering those, of course, uh, as I grew up, was the sense of empowerment that I felt mm. when there were a lot of uh, wonderful Greek comedic actors. Uh, and Nick Giannopoulos is one of the, the ones mm. that I remember very early on with Acropolis Now, uh, Wogs Out of Work. And as a teenager, it was no longer something to be embarrassed by. Mm. Uh, it was no longer something that people could then damage me by yelling out, Wog by this or Wog by that. It was something that I owned with a sense of pride. Mm. Mm. And um, what what year was that when you when you felt that kind of pride? How long ago was this? Yeah, I reckon I was a teenager already, uh, and I suspect it was probably around the ages of thirteen or fourteen. So yeah. uh, even though I look very youthful uh, for those on the video and for those <laughs> listening to the podcast, I'm a lot younger than I even sound. Yeah. Uh, but we're probably talking about mid to late nineteen eighties. Nineteen eighties, I thought so. Yeah. And it was really probably around then, Salma, that you came to Australia, right? Yeah, I arrived here in uh, 83. Yeah. Very different place then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So both of you have very different memories, yeah? So, Philip, I, I, I want to I stick with this theme of your background a little bit because it was your grandfather who was in the concentration camp, is that right? Is it Dachau? Yeah. So, so not only that, I mean, it's a... It's a fascinating tale of uh, endeavour, of the idea that uh, my grandparents were married and a week later, eight days later, my grandfather was taken by the Nazis uh, from my grandmother mm -hmm. and interned in Dachau concentration camp. Now, uh, my aunt has done a huge amount of work researching and writing two books uh, on my grandparents uh, and uh, on her memories. And as best as we've been able to understand, my grandfather's nephew had been involved in some political sub subversive uh, activity, mm -hmm. which is no surprise when you now look at my background. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had lent, my grandfather had lent him his car. And as a result of that action, the Nazis had obviously detained uh, my grandfather's nephew uh, and then by extension, uh, then uh, took him. And he then spent three and a half years, firstly in Dachau and then to another other concentration labour camps. And throughout that time, my grandmother, who had not worked a day in her life, 
all of a sudden had to provide for herself mm -hmm. and of course her, her parents and she had two brothers as well. Then in 1938, uh, the Nazis had a policy of allowing Jews to flee Germany with nothing but a suitcase and the clothes on their back. And I always get this part of the story wrong, so I, I will no doubt receive a message from my mother. But as my recollection is that they went uh, via mainland to Italy, and then from Italy, they caught a boat that took them to Shanghai, which was the only port open to Jewish refugees from fleeing Europe. And uh, they arrived there in late 1939. And then my mother was born in Shanghai in 1940. My aunt was born there in 1944. And this is really, I mean, you know, the history is so rich for so many people, right? And, and so if we fast forward, in late 1946, my grandmother's first cousin, Berthold Meyer, was living in Gippsland. Now, why was he living in Gippsland? Because this is equally as a fascinating story. He was one of the original Dunera boys. And for those of you that don't know the history of the Dunera, the Dunera was a ship of uh, Jewish refugees fleeing Europe that went to land in England. And England said, we don't want you. So of course, what does England do in 19, uh, the, the, the late 1930s, 40s? They, well, what they've done always, they sent the ship out to Australia. Mm. So he came out here, he and his family were interned in Gippsland, and then after a period of time were released. And then he saw my grandmother's name uh, and her family on the Red Cross refugee list, and he sponsored them out here. And that's how my grandmother, one of her brothers who's since passed away, and uh, her parents, and my mum and my aunt came to living in Melbourne, Victoria, because one of my grandmother's other brothers had a visa approved and he went to, of all places, Youngstown, Ohio. So we have family in the United States uh, and obviously our family here in Melbourne. Now, your grandmother was clearly a formidable woman because I have read that she actually took a bus from Melbourne to Canberra to meet with the immigration minister. What did she talk to him about? And mind oh my, you, can you imagine that happening now, right? I mean, oh. my grandmother getting in a bus to go and take it. it would never yeah. happen. And she did it, but clearly formidable. What did she talk about? Oh, she come from good stock. Yeah. yeah, I tell you what, I mean, you know, again, the stories of yesteryear, you just couldn't imagine them being replicated. The idea that somebody today, A, could go to Parliament House and then demand to see the immigration minister, have the minister then take that meeting and then subsequently uh, changed their view. So what happened was, uh, obviously my grandmother's family experience was that they were sponsored out here. Well, my grandmother left friends back in Shanghai who had no family here to sponsor them. Mm. And that's why she traveled to Canberra to request a visa for them in order for them to be able to come out here. Mm. And the immigration minister at the time took the meeting and then granted the visa. Wow. That family uh, that family, and our family still remain very close. Uh, and I take the, the Yiddish word is nachas. I take a lot of joy, a lot of happiness out of the fact that the, uh, the, the next generation down, we are all close. Uh, and uh, it's now up to us to make sure that our children uh, also similarly strike up a, a, a strong uh, friendship and bond that still exists to this day. Beautiful. Is that are those stories carried down in your in your family gatherings? Do your children know those stories? Yeah. So uh, I have one older sister. Uh, yeah. She lives in America. She married an American guy some twenty two years ago, I think it is now, and she's got three children. Lives in San Diego, mm. uh, and it's fair to say, and she, I don't think Marina would be embarrassed by this. It's fair to say that I've always been the one out of the tours that have been uh, a more interested in our family uh, background and also felt that connection. Mm. Uh, and of my three children, uh, I'm yet to sort of see which one of them will uh, sort of feel a far greater affinity with their background than the others. But they've all asked questions of, of different degrees. And one's 15, one's 12, one's eight. So they've mm -hmm. got a bit of time ahead of them. Mm, for sure, for sure. I'm going to challenge you to share those stories at your dinner table tonight. Just a little bit. <laughs> Done. Now, I want to um, ask you this question because I, I don't think I've ever asked you this question about how you charted your way 
into government and politics? Because I believe well, you were a consultant, were you not? Did you? Can you admit to being a consultant in uh, consulting? <laughs> absolutely. So I started my career uh, at Deloitte in uh, chartered accounting, uh, and I spent, uh, I think it was two and a half, nearly three years at Deloitte before I left and became the financial controller of a small family group of companies. Uh, from there, I went to Centro Property Group and worked in their property finance team. At this point, for those of you know, that know the history of Centro, uh, I joined them when their share price was $3.30 and I left when their share price was $7.70. Uh, subsequent to that, they went up to $10, but they also then went down to $0.04 cents and went into receivership. So I only take, uh, I only take responsibility for the share growth while I was there. And then, of course, I jumped over into politics, but I was always very interested in politics from a young age and, and far from uh, embarrassing my father, being a rebellious teenager, when I was, I think it was 15, I did an assignment on the Labor Party for my politics class at school. Mm. And that, in, that entailed me going out to Labor Party head office, which was, I think, at that stage in Drummond Street, Carlton. Mm. That's how long ago it was. And I bought uh, the rules book. And the person I remember selling me the rules book thought that I was the weirdest kid because who buys an ALP rules book? But it was for an assignment. And of course, while I was there, I did what any teenager that wanted to annoy their parents would do, is I took a membership form and joined the Labor Party to really piss off my father. And it, I'm sure it worked. Uh, but I've got to say, uh, jokes aside, that I couldn't have wanted for a more supportive uh, parent than my father and also my mother for when I went into politics and, and I even got dad handing out how to vote cards for me. Wow. And I'm sure that that was, I'm sure that that was hard work for him. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, so I was, I was also interested to, to understand um, how you felt at that time because, you know, you held that, um, the minister portfolio from I think it was 2015 to about 20, 2018, 2019. How did you feel? What was it like? Um, because you've always, as I introduced in this podcast, you always speak your mind. How did you find that transition um, really being clear about your views and your values when you really have quite a disruptive uh, thinking um, with with you and how you operate, so I'm um, I'm considering that you would have had significant, um, you know, different opinions and backlash from different people in within the Labour Party and 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 outside. And how did you cope, still holding on to those values, those good family values that you grew up with, and just this focus on multiculturalism? How did you hold on to that despite you know that time yeah. being quite quite heated? It's a it's a it's a really insightful question. Uh, Div, because there are many aspects to uh, both being in parliament, being part of a political party, obviously testing, challenging, uh, and attempting to arrive at the best public policy you can. Mm. That's not necessarily the best public policy, but the best public policy that you can arrive at. Mm. Now, when I, when I joined up to a political party, one of the things that I had to reconcile was to a degree losing some independence. That meant when there was an issue for debate or discussion that I needed to be prepared to enter that debate, that discussion and acknowledge and appreciate and understand and reconcile that there were times that I would not necessarily have an outcome that either I was comfortable with mm. or that I had uh, effectively advocated for. Mm -hmm. If I couldn't have agreed to that, then don't sign up to a political party. But for mine... Uh, if I was prepared to agree to that, which I was, then you then have to abide by the outcome, whether you agree with it or not. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there are a number of different parts to this that I'll, I'll quickly um, uh, finish on. There was the way that I ran my ministerial and my electorate offices, the way that uh, I conducted myself both in cabinet and also the way I, did, I, I conducted myself within the caucus. Mm -hmm. It's fair to say, again, cabinet, is where you challenge and you test ideas. But once you make a decision, you make your decision, right? It's mm -hmm. in that respect, it's very much a team game. Mm -hmm. And you own the, whether you agreed with it or not, you own the decision when you walk out of the cabinet room mm -hmm. for better or worse. Mm -hmm. Now in my office, it's fair to say that uh, I uh, had people 
that tested and challenged and pushed and poked and prodded me uh, better than anybody. And I wouldn't have had it any other way and I still wouldn't. Mm. I could walk out onto Burke Street and find a thousand people that are prepared to always say, yes, you're, one, you're wonderful and that's the best idea I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. But that's not going to do the right thing by me or to the policy that I was working on. Mm. So I absolutely encourage my staff to challenge me, as I did, by the way, uh, my senior public servants and the executive that I worked with day in, day out. Mm. Philip, I'm going to um, change tact a little bit with you. I know that you are a very strong advocate on the issue of violence against women. It's something that I'm very passionate about and have done a lot of work in that space as well with White Ribbon. Our, um, as of last week, we had 49 women in Australia who have been killed so far. We're still averaging one woman a week. In fact, there was a day last week where we had three deaths in Australia in the one day, and that did not make the front page news across any newspaper. It is an absolute blight on us that that is the case. Now, from your perspective, you know, we've been doing a lot in this arena, I think, since Jill Ma died, it came to the forefront um, and has remained in the forefront. Um, Rosie Batty did a lot of work in this space. Yet what are we missing because the numbers, despite all the work so many people have done, the numbers are not changing. What are we missing or what are we not doing? I mean, do you, have you got an opinion on that? Yeah, I know, it's long, a big question. How, how, how long do we have, right? <laughs> so, I mean, the first, the first thing that I'd openly acknowledge is that on this particular issue, I don't have the answers, right? I, I'm not an expert uh, in this area. I'm on a not-for-profit board in the family violence or domestic violence space a board called Impact for Women. Uh, it does some amazing work based here in Victoria. We have aspirations to hopefully take impact uh, Australia-wide. We run a range of programs and, and provide a range of assistance. It's led uh, unbelievably by a woman by the name of Kathy Kaplan, who does a tremendous job. And part of me wanting to be involved was because of the relationship that I had with one of my former colleagues, um, the very dear late Fiona Richardson, mm. who was the first minister uh, appointed to obviously the Royal Commission. She, she was minister with responsibility for the Royal Commission against family violence. She was also uh, the uh, first, uh, first female minister that was uh, looking after obviously victims as well in that respect. And her, her passion and commitment to try and change this was matched only uh, by her tenacity in to try and make sure that those voices, those victims were heard, either alive or sadly having passed away. Now, I remember a conversation I had with Fee where she had put a policy position. Why is it when there's a domestic incident why is it that women and children are removed from the home and put in uh, a refuge? Why is the man mm. not removed from the house? Why are we ensuring that both women and children, A, don't feel safe and B, have to go to a new space that is not theirs where they have to try and rearrange their lives in order for that to happen? And it was simple thinking like that that got me really engaged with the subject. And when the government was formed after 14, uh, after the election in 2014, Fiona and I had spoken about creating a parliamentary friendship group for family violence. And Fiona uh, encouraged me to do it and I wanted to. And I was the, one of the inaugural co-chairs of that parliamentary group. Now, to, to honour her work and her legacy, saw me want to be involved in the way that I am. But to come back to your initial question, uh, I actually uh, put, some, uh, put a, some, a social media post about this just a couple of weeks ago, where I posed the exact same question that you ironically posed to me today. Why is it that the, in the midst of the epidemic that we are faced with, that this is not on the front page of mm. every newspaper leading every news bulletin every day? until we get a resolution. Now, forgive me for being a little bit crass, but as a result of COVID-19, we have had probably tens of billions of dollars spent around the world working on a vaccine. Fantastic. 
Absolutely, we should, no doubt about it. Why don't we have people, have philanthropists, have governments also equally determined to try and either provide a safe space for women and children that feel threatened before something happens to them mm. or ensure that men get the support that they need because it's a double-edged sword yes. here, get, get the support that they need, whether it be medical, whether it be through therapy and counselling, doesn't matter what it is, where we can also try and change the status quo. Because right now from where I sit, the status quo is not a great place for us to be. No, and, and there needs to be so much more work done. And it has to be pushed down from a government level, I believe, to, well, to make those changes. Well, Sadna, let me put something to you. You've been asking the questions of me. <laughs> You're going to reverse me, this, are you? Right? Oh, my Absolutely. gosh. Let, there we go. Let me put a, let me put a <laughs> question it. to you. And, let me See, I'm disrupting. Let me put a question Love to it. you and Jim, right? So this, these are the incidents that police we know about because they've resulted in tragic mm. outcomes, tragic circumstances, mm. deaths. Mm. What percentage of women from a migrant or a non-English speaking background mm. experience this and do not report it mm. because of either cultural experiences, mm. fear from being isolated mm. uh, in their communities or because the man uh, through the ethnic and cultural experience has both total control and financial control and the woman is not in a position to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. I suspect that we would be facing statistics that would make people cry for weeks. Mm -hmm. And I'd be, I'll put to you, what do you believe is yeah. happening out there? Oh, and look, I've done some work with a number of um, women, Indian women in this space and, and have heard some horrific stories where, you know, they've been brought over as brides, um, yet their husband is already married to somebody else or is in another relationship. They've been burnt. They've been murdered. They uh, have been uh, turned into slaves. The, the stories are horrific. And it only has been recently in Victoria that the police have actually understood what a mm. dowry bride actually even means mm. and and how that violence is connected so you're right we need to do a lot of work not not just in the the space around how do we stop the violence against women but how do we stop the violence against women in minority groups as mm. well and, and, and I want to say thank you for your work on this so, you know I, for women um, having men like you stand with us is really important to have your voice on this issue is really important because without that voice and without men like you standing with us and questioning the status quo and having the influence that you do this isn't going to change mm. now i've heard you previously quote that we are not born with bias bias is something that we learn and i love i love the fact that you have said this because it is so true so true i agree my, my question around this is what is it in our existing culture and society you think that teaches us to be biased then? Well, look, let me put my hands up. Uh, in the video, you'll be able to see this in the podcast, you won't, uh, and say that uh, I hate Collingwood and there is nothing that anyone can do. <laughs> I'm with you on that one. <laughs> that, that will convince me that I need to hug or love a Collingwood supporter. Biases aside, right, I learned that I love my mother dearly but I learned that from my mother early on, right? And then my learnt experiences in the schoolyard was actually to really hate Essendon supporters because growing up in the 80s as a St Kilda supporter, we were hopeless then and Essendon were not. And we got the curry from Essendon supporters every day of the football season. Mm -hmm. So there are learned experiences. And jokes aside, I use that analogy because... Uh, it's sometimes very difficult when you learn something to unlearn it. And uh, for fear of, of using personal experiences with my, my own children, I will say, I've got, as I said, two girls and a boy, and I will say to them uh, jokingly, whether you bring home a girl or whether you bring home a boy, I just want you to be happy. Now, the, the natural reaction from my children is to say one more or the other, Dad, I'm not gay. And my response is, I don't really care if you are, just want you to be happy. So clearly, they already have sensed or experienced 
either through watching uh, subconsciously on television or through their friendship circles, this understanding that, uh, well, the same sex issue is not an issue, but they need to reaffirm who they are, right? Now, I don't say that to embarrass them because it, that's not the point of my, my analogy. The, the point is that uh, we, and I, I catch myself doing it, and by the way, to stop myself from doing it, uh, I made it very clear with my son from a very young age, whatever colour the next plate or bowl was from the cupboard was the colour or the plate that he got. And if he wanted an orange plate, well, he would have to wait till the orange plate came up. And if the next one happened to be pink, so be it. So all right, just little things like that are what we have to be taking responsibility for in the way that we bring our children up. And then when there is uh, a degree of discrimination, whether it's age, whether it's race, whether it's gender, whether it's disability, it doesn't matter. We have to be prepared to say something and it's gonna be uncomfortable. And it's not, and, and any, any outcome that we try and achieve, if it's not uncomfortable, I would challenge you to ask you, do you need to actually achieve it? Because, because that in and of itself suggests to me that, uh, that if it's not uncomfortable, then the challenge is not there, which means that we've already succeeded. And, and, and uh, you know, again, I, I can only say that it is learnt. We need to try and unlearn it. And I do that to myself all the time, right? There are times when I'll pull myself up from making jokes um, about what I'm responsible for or what my wife's responsible for. And I have to think about it and go, well, hang on, that's probably not right. There are times where I'll make a politically incorrect joke. And, and you know what? That's okay too, but it's all about context. But if you do it and there's even the slightest undertone of putting somebody down by using it, that's a very different story. And I think that part of the problem has been, uh, forgive me for saying that at times we are far too politically correct in society. What that's meant is that it detracts from the times when we need to have a serious conversation. If we are always telling people you can't say that, even if you're trying an attempt at humour, even if it's not funny to somebody, right? What, what happens is when there's a really important time that we need to get people's attention and say, this is not on, we lose the opportunity because people disengage. Mm. That doesn't make it right, by the way, mm -hmm. right? By no stretch am I, am I making allowances for people making jokes that are politically incorrect. But of course, it's all about context. If I'm Greek and I make a joke, so for example, well, it was the 2004 World Cup and the joke used to be, why did Greece uh, always miss out on World Cups? Because every time they got a corner, they'd put a fish and chip shop there, right? Now, <laughs> right, I always say, I'm Greek, I can get away with saying that, right? And that's okay. But for somebody else whose father and mother slaved 18 hours a day, inefficient chip shop mm. they mm. may not find that funny mm. and so understanding that what our sense of humor may be may impact on somebody else is understanding uh the impact and the power that words can have both positively and negatively mm. so true so true i'm going to jump in there and just pick up on what you've said about um bias being learned and taking a long time to unlearn it and i'm just going to ask you to think about that in the context of the black lives matters movement and for me from my perspective for people of color in australia i just can't be patient till someone unlearns to be less racist or or just stops being racist so i just want to put that there for your commentary and opinion in that um you know all of this un focus on unconscious bias training in the workplace and the amount of money that has been spent on leaders and them unlearning their bias has really resulted in a lack of representation and inclusion of people of color anywhere in media and politics in our businesses and our you know any community leadership even um, so you look at fairer victoria multicultural victoria respect victoria all held a leadership held by white anglo-saxon and european leaders and and all of the people that represent the community are sitting down the middle 
And, and so what's your yeah. opinion on that? You know, that the, this waiting for this unlearning to happen. Mm. Again, you know, awesome question. Uh, and I have a range of answers that might sound a little bit contradictory. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's okay. I don't mind contradicting myself because I think that there's never a simple or a, a, a black or white, pardon the pun, answer to any of these questions. Mm -hmm. The first one is at times I get a little bit annoyed at Europeans being introduced in a, some kind of a homogenous way with white Anglo-Saxons mm. because uh, I understand why we are uh, and obviously both my parents come from European backgrounds. Mm -hmm. But my experience is very different from what it would have been if my name was Smith or Johnson or mm. Jones, right? And, and so at times I get frustrated because the eternal struggle that I had from a young boy was being identified as being different because of my surname mm. uh, or because that I had olive skin or because of the kind of food that was in my lunchbox or because I should be playing soccer at lunchtime. Why are you playing football? Mm -hmm. right? so, so it comes from all of our experiences. But I, I, I truly, I get why people believe that people, even with my background, are privileged versus others. And, we, and that's where I said I'll contradict myself because I appreciate we have had privilege. And I appreciate that my experience, Div, is very different from yours mm -hmm. as an ethnic woman, mm -hmm. where you get the double whammy. You're both a woman and an ethnic as well. And then together, you've only squared the amount of times of, of trouble and challenge that you've faced. Mm -hmm. So uh, when, what I think we need to do from the start is acknowledge that we are all going to face a degree of discrimination, mm -hmm. right? And by the way, part of the problems that we've got is that no one form of discrimination is greater than the other. They're all learned experiences. So, for example, a white Anglo-Saxon woman or man in their mid to late 50s out of jobs, unemployed, trying to get back into the workforce, are going to be discriminated against because of their age. A different type of discrimination, but nevertheless discrimination in and of itself. Mm. So... Uh, I think the first thing is that we need to try and move away from ascribing a depth of experience or feeling to discrimination and just say, you know what, we all experience it. How do we overcome it? Mm. And if we do that, I come back to a line that I always used to say as a minister uh, when I was talking about the issue of diversity in terms of gender within the tech sector. I My, my one line that I always used to say, my wife used to... My, I could, I'd get home from having given a speech and my wife would say, so-and-so was in your speech and they said, Philip speaking. And Deborah used to say, that's my wife's name, has he said this? And they all, invariably always said, oh my God, he just said it. And what that line was, it was never about the men in the room. It was always about the women not in the room. Meaning men don't need to be afraid of having this discussion when they're already part of the conversation. We need to be afraid of the fact that there are women that are not part of the discussion and how do we bring them in? Mm. Similarly, we need to make sure that whether it's somebody experiencing that discrimination because of age, gender, race, religion, uh, uh, language, uh, language or linguistic capabilities, et cetera, that we try and bridge those gaps for them and assist them through. And of course, the biggest one right? I'm telling you right now, and we, none of us on this call will have experienced this, is the limitation of physical disability. Mm -hmm. And I, I go back to my, one of my first years at Monash University Caulfield campus, and we used to run uh, a disability uh, agenda on a day where we used to get kids put into wheelchairs and try and move around the campus mm -hmm. so that they could understand how limiting some of our disability access issues were. Mm. Unless you literally walk in somebody's footsteps, mm. you will not appreciate or understand what they've been through. And that doesn't negate what everybody goes through. Some, some good commentary there, but um, can I ask you, what do you think it'll take for 
race and cultural diversity to change in in Australian businesses like we've had the gender movement um, really focused on targets and quotas and that's made some significant change in the last 10 years what do you think will be a, a real game changer for us to see some real representation because I've been at this for eight years and I haven't really seen as much of the pushing that I do I haven't really seen that quick flip um, because we don't have a target it's not measured right so we, we just don't know we can can engage people and influence them from a heart perspective to include race and culturally diverse people um in in leadership but it's it's not happening it's glacially slow yep. what do you think so i believe in affirmative action right some people will tell you that i was a victim of affirmative action when the premier wanted a 50 50 gender diverse cabinet and i was the bloke that had to make way well it doesn't matter right that's history the fact of the matter is as a result of that, there are women around Victoria, if not around Australia, that can point to the cabinet that Daniel Andrews runs and be proud of the fact that if they're a woman in politics in Victoria, they have an opportunity that five years ago they did not. Mm -hmm. Right? That's a tremendous legacy for the Premier to leave. And I'm absolutely supportive of what Daniel did. Uh, I think it's a great outcome. And yes, there are going to be victims along the way who will miss out because they don't have what is needed to get to where they need to go. Well, you know what, that's tough because unless we do something to disrupt the status quo, we've seen the status quo does not change. Mm -hmm. So when I was a minister, as I would right now, right? I would say to the AICD, right? They should be calling out boards that do not have 50-50 gender diverse boards, right? When we have a community that is over 50, just 50, 51% uh, female, and you have a board that is almost exclusively blokes, right? That needs mm. to be fixed. Now, I'll put my hand up. I'm on the board of an ASX company and we have one woman uh, out of five directors. But when I joined the board, I did say to the chairman, we need to fix this. As long as we have a plan to fix it, I'll come on board. And to his credit, we have a plan and we're going through recruitment uh, and looking to try and change that diversity mix. It has to start somewhere. It doesn't have to be done by tomorrow, but you have to have a plan in place. If we called upon boards of the ASX top 50, for example, to say in your, in your annual report, you must publish uh, what your plan is to ensure that your board is representative, you'd see boards then be held to account, right? So I think that in 2020, nearly 2021, and thank God we're almost finished with 2020 because it's been a shit year, mm. right? But what we need to do is we need to shake things up. We need to challenge the status quo. And by the way, again, women is good. Diversity doesn't just stop with gender, mm. right? So, for example, if you are an Asian man or an Asian woman, what is the likelihood of your getting onto an ASX top 50 board? We've got them, but they're not everywhere. Yeah. Right. So, or what about people that have a disability, whether it be a physical disability or whether it be a learning disability? Mm -hmm. how, how do we represent them? Mm -hmm. Now, we don't need to have a look at a board and say we need a board of 50 people so that we can have everybody represented. But I'll give you this. If we start to try and have at least 50 50 gender diverse targets, you will start to solve some of those other issues. So, again, when I used to speak about uh, gender equity issues in the tech. I used to have people say, you only ever talk about women. And I say, I don't always talk about women, but I'm telling you now that if we fix the issue with women, then we will start to automatically fix some of those other issues as well. Mm. Right? And, and so I think that the time has come for us to stop giving platitudes and patting ourselves on the back because we've managed to get 30% of women on, on company boards. Well, you know what? Uh, let's shake it up let's change mm. the dial yeah i'm so glad you said that i'm just going to jump in there because i do think now we need to look at the composition because i think that everyone's been focused on 40 40 20 50 50 30 percent but no one's looking um at the composition of that board anymore like to your point philip you know women yes but what other intersectionalities are we looking at are we looking at racial and cultural diversity you know diversibilities age 
uh, because the composition makes for good decision making on a board and risk management on a board and good governance. It, you know, what I'm seeing very much so, especially in the ASX boards, are you know replacements of females from a sa the same socioeconomic class, same backgrounds as the men who have previously held those roles. So really, I wonder how diverse and disruptive those conversations are to manage risk. And you can see some of the fallouts this year of companies that have not had good diverse compositions of boards. Um, so I really like your point about that because I think the time is now to ask about composition more than just gender. So I just wanted to reaffirm that. And I want you to ask your ASX board uh, about what other compositions they can have in terms of diversity. Will you do that for me? Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. I think you make a good point also, and, and this is um, a bandwagon that I've been on for a long time, which is, you know, I think for a long time in Australia, we've used the word diversity just on the gender perspective. But diversity is about people and people come in different packages, ethnicity, sexuality and ability. And if leaders across the country just had a look at just through those lenses at and not just talking about ASX companies, you know, I, I'd like us to talk about all businesses and to measure mm. diversity in this country just through the lenses of ASX companies is wrong. Mm. We have to measure this across all companies. And I'd like to see the numbers come, ac come out across all businesses, not just ASX, because uh, there are more other companies than ASX companies. Then I think um, we will move the dial forward. And I like your point about, you know, let's make the reporting public, not just for ASX companies, but for all businesses to say, you know, this is what we're doing in this space, because it makes for an attractive business then. One in four people in this country are migrants. We've got a huge talent pool of people to mentor and sponsor into these leadership um, board roles and positions. And I think, you know, the biggest blockage at the moment is the current crop of leaders running these businesses. Can I say something really controversial? Go for it. Love it. Do it. And, and, I, and I, I'm happy for, by the way, I'm happy for both of you to slap me down <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you disagree with me, right? Sure. So there were times <laughs> that I would talk about, for example, and I'd use my children, I'd say, my eldest two are girls and my youngest is my son. And I don't want my girls facing discrimination on the basis of their sex, which I was responsible for. And I had a woman uh, attack me uh, in a speech that I gave. How dare you? You should want uh, diversity and gender equity to be uh, achieved because it's the right thing to do. I'm so sick of hearing men talk about their daughters and their wives and their mothers and their sisters, etc. And my response to her then, and I've thought about this a lot, and I do, uh, and my response today is exactly the same. It has not changed. It doesn't matter what journey the guy has gone on to come to that realisation. What matters is the destination that they've got there. So to the women out there that, uh, that get frustrated by men that say that and say we should want for more, absolutely. The first priority should always be it's the right thing to do. I don't take away from that. Uh, I don't resolve from that but we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. If somebody's journey is because they want their daughters to not be discriminated against, embrace it, take it. Be grateful that they've actually come to that realization as distinct from some guy who's got children and hasn't come to that realization, right? So again, we should be trying to encourage people to get to that, uh, that understanding and then when they've got to that understanding, also say to them, hey, by the way, it's also the right thing to do. And you know what? They'll say, yeah, it absolutely is. I, I just, I, I feel that uh, I have thick enough skin from my time in public office that I've never been concerned or worried about people having that point of view or putting it to me that somehow I've let them down because I've used that analogy. Uh, because as I said, it's the right thing to do. I, I understand that and I live by that in that respect. But I'm worried that somehow we're going to make it more difficult for people to want to come onto that journey if we're going to have people that will uh, take them to task for saying that. Take them to task for saying that if they then don't walk the walk, mm -hmm. right? If they're going to talk it and not walk it, by all means, hold them to account. But if they're going to talk it and walk it, embrace them, encourage them, support them, and try and get them to then become 
male champions of change are in both their own businesses, their industries, their friendship circles, et cetera. And that is how we will continue to encourage change. Oh, I agree with you. I don't disagree I don't at all. I don't disagree at all. I, honestly, and you know what? I think I've experienced this as well with um, running our business in race and cultural diversity at a time where most people didn't want to hear about it. Um, and I got CEOs and senior leaders to say yes to me to work on race and cultural diversity because they saw a business case for it and they saw um, their customers uh, and revenue lines associated with it. And they said yes because of those reasons. And I got tackled on a panel as well saying that um, you don't need a business case for it. Why, why, do, why am I building a commercial sense around race and cultural inclusion from a customer perspective? And I said very similar things to you. I'm going to take that yes, because once I'm in there, I'm making the change and I got there in the end and this lead is changing. And then we go inside their organizations and we're looking at their, the employees who are designing products and services who should be representative of those customers. So I got my yes in the end. I feel like I'm still winning. So I'm totally with you. I, I definitely won't slap that uh, commentary down when when you definitely, I agree, when you get the action. How about you, Sana? No, I'm, I'm not going to slap it. And I think also a lot of this starts at, at home as well. You know, I think um, you've got to have that view in your, and particularly for those of us who come from culturally diverse backgrounds, and I had this conversation with someone this morning, we can't go into the workplace and demand equality when we can't demand it in our own homes. We mm. have to fight for the equality in our own homes. And so many of us who come from culturally diverse backgrounds have the double glazed glass ceiling. Mm. We have to smash these massive thick ceilings in our own environments first, mm. Mm. Uh, where from a culture and religious perspective, women are seen as second class citizens. And then we have to go in the work to do it. But the first fight needs to be on the home front. We've got to get, we've got to win the battle there before we can expect to win it in, in corporate Australia. Just, just an, another, another change of tact again. Um, and I'm going to date this podcast. So we, we're talking in December, 2020, as you said, we've all had enough of 2020. It's been a shit year and it's taken a lot of our, a lot from many of us this year. We, we're coming into 2021. And of course we're celebrating Australia day. It's a day that many of our First Nations people see as Invasion Day. What are your thoughts on, on, on changing that whole uh, paradigm around that, that celebration of that day? Well, I wrote on this uh, in Australia Day, January 2019, before I left Parliament. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll find, I wrote it on LinkedIn as a, a contribution piece. I'll get it to you uh, as a link and I'll, I'll let you somehow connect into Beautiful. it um, when you do it. My, my position was uh, twofold. We can't have an Australia Day celebration if we are alienating our first people. If they can't feel a part of the celebration, it doesn't matter whether it's a recent feeling or whether it's people go, oh, they never felt like this before. Well, you know what? Things change, right? People change. My, I'm the first generation in my family. My view of Australia is framed and formed by my experiences. That makes me no less an Australian as somebody who is a sixth generation Australian whose forebears were convicts, right? So again, if our Indigenous, our, our Aboriginal Australian Torres Strait Islanders cannot embrace the day because they ascribe the 26th of January with Invasion Day, and that's not, it's not all of them, but enough of them, then we need to say that that day is not the appropriate day as our national day of celebration. Now, I would love, and I'm being 100% serious here, I would love that at the appropriate time in our future when we become a republic, and it will happen, it may not happen for 10 or so. 20 years, but it will happen at some point. I hope it happens in my lifetime. But if and when that day comes, I would love for that date to be the 8th of May because uh, it becomes mate, May 8, mate day. And I don't think there's <laughs> anything more... Of, I'm being serious now. You heard it first here. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do not think that there is anything more Australian than having a mate day, just like may the fourth be with you for those Star Wars fans out there is a day that I love, <laughs> right? 
So, so uh, again, that doesn't, by the way, mean that we can't celebrate what the 26th means to us historically. The fact of the matter is that as a result of British settlement, Australia is the country it is today. We can't change our history, but we can certainly learn from it. And unfortunately, that history shows us that when white settlement occurred, some injustices, murder on a systemic level was committed against our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Mm. We have to own up to that. We have to acknowledge it. And it means that the 26th can be celebrated as Foundation Day, but it's not an Australia Day. Mm. And, and, and so uh, I articulate this in the, uh, the effectively the op-ed that I wrote at the time. Mm. And, uh, and I, I don't think my views of this have changed. I'll, I'll, I'll just add to it, and again, this might sound slightly contradictory. I, I don't believe it's the right day, but I also don't believe that we have the right to unilaterally try and change that date at the moment or to disenfranchise those people that do wish to celebrate the day uh, until we settle on something. So I think that until we can find a new date that we can settle on and agree to in a mature and sensible way as a country, that 26th of January remains the date that we come together as a country, but we should also do what I think, and I applaud this by councils, that they acknowledge the date and the ceremony by acknowledging the atrocities that were committed against our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And then they can celebrate what uh, obviously Foundation Day then means as part of the Australia Day celebration. Mm. Mm. I, and, and I'd love to um, link that article in for all of our listeners when we publish this. And, and then added to that, here's, here's another question, man. Right? added to that is our constitution was written in 1901. The Australian constitution was written in 1901 and it did not take into account First Nations people, anyone of colour and women. Is it about time we rewrote that? Yeah, absolutely. I, like that's that's... It's basic, that's, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So I, re I remember, I think it was year 11. I'm not going to tell you which year it was because, as I said, I'm very youthful looking and I don't want you to think I'm older than I, than, than I look. I, I had the very great fortune of interviewing Nugget Coombs uh, in year 11, a very famous uh, Aboriginal Australian. And uh, part of that was Nugget had spent time in service in the Australian Defence Force. And of course, this is one of the, this is not dissimilar, by the way, to the experience of African American men uh, in the United States. They were accepted in our defence forces, and it was acceptable for them to risk and give up their lives for our respective countries. And yet, somehow, when it came to voting or acceptance in society, it wasn't accepted. Now, that, that, that just, to me, is uh, completely both unacceptable mm. and incongru incongruous of us as a country and where we want to be. So, for me, acknowledging that this country had people here before it was settled, right, it's not threatening to us as people. It's not threatening to me as an individual. We've dealt with native title. It doesn't mean that there's going to be a land right over my home. This is all nonsense, right? But if it means and it affords some basic common decency for uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people around our country to feel more confident in themselves, to feel more accepted, right? Uh, and I'll finish on this note. Uh, we all make jokes about New Zealand. Uh, our little neighbour, our little cousin across the ditch, etc. We have so much to learn from New Zealand. They were the first country to give women the vote. They had an emissions trading scheme. We still don't. They got fibre to the home. We still don't. And most importantly, the Treaty of Waitangi, mm. right, has been there as a roadmap for what we have needed to do here. And by the way, I don't know about you, but I get... I get goosebumps when I hear in a, a New Zealand sporting contest them singing the national anthem in Maori and then English. Yeah. I get goosebumps. 
The haka is something I, I want to sit down with a, a New Zealander of Maori descent to explain it to me. I think I understand it from what I've read, but you know, those types of embracing of culture mm -hmm. in New Zealand suggest to me that Australia has so much more to learn from New Zealand and it's really not that hard. It's there. Absolutely. And it changes the, the dialogue on inclusion for sure because that translates, that acceptance of First Nations people changes the, the dialogue on race um, and cultural inclusion. It, it just is in every fabric of inclusion, whether it's at society or community level or in business. And you see that in New Zealand of how the, you know, the community can come together. Um, so I want to, um, we're getting to the time of this podcast where we ask all of our guests for a call to action. I did want to ask you about the immigration policy and how COVID has kind of paused it and yeah. Some Australians feel that this is a good thing and hopefully we never have, um, you know, levels of uh, immigration like we've had in the past. So I wonder if you can weave that in um, to your call to action with that sentiment in the back of your mind. What do you say to business leaders, to people of colour who are listening to this podcast? How do we change our future for more race and cultural inclusion in business and our society? Uh, it's, a simp it's actually a really simple answer. By refusing to accept the status quo. Now, the more complicated issue is how do you do that and what do you do with it? Mm -hmm. And that will be a very individual answer to each and every individual. And I don't mean that to be a bit of a cop-out. But for some people, their level of comfort might be walking down Burke Street with a placard in their hand, waving it, saying, I won't settle for this any longer. Mm -hmm. It might be for somebody having a quiet conversation at home or around the barbecue with their neighbours. It, it, it doesn't matter what it is. Mm -hmm. It has to be something that they're comfortable with mm -hmm. because otherwise two things happen. It becomes forced and it's inauthentic mm -hmm. and it won't work. Because if somebody's not comfortable with what they do, then they're unlikely to carry it through. Mm -hmm. Now, for me, I was very fortunate. From a young age, my mother and father encouraged me to have a voice and to express the opinion. I've tried to do the same with my own children. As, at times with my 15-year-old, I regret that decision nearly every day. But jokes aside, I know that it's going to hold her in good stead. And it's also raising children the way that I was raised and knowing for them that they have the confidence to know that their voice should be heard and that they have a right to voice their opinion professionally, respectfully, courteously, by all means, but they nevertheless have a right to express that. And, you know, in terms of a call to action, I've never thought about this before, but you know what I'd love to see us do to shake things up? And I reckon that this could go some way uh, as well. Wouldn't it be great that in primary school that for from, and I mean literally from prep right through to grade six, that in every primary school in Victoria, that we were able to find some Indigenous teachers to teach about the local tribe where that primary school was located uh, and the language and the customs, right? because I think that that would go a long way to both giving a sense of dignity to our Indigenous Australians, uh, but also inclusive. Now, at the same time, again, remember I said to you at the beginning of our chat, there are times I'm going to probably contradict myself. I'm a white fella. So as much as that might be my view, it means nothing if it's not what our Indigenous uh, brothers and sisters would want. So I can have some great ideas, but if it's not what their ideas are, then it's just some more white noise, to be honest with you. Mm. Very good points. And what a big call to action for sure. Sadna, how about you? What's your call oh, to action this so episode? Look, when, are you, when are you getting back into politics? <laughs> uh, I'd love to see you shake it up again. Come on. We need, we need voices like yours out there. 
Oh, that's that's very kind. But I, I genuinely believe in moving forward. The reasons that I left, uh, if anything, have been reaffirmed over lockdown. You know, uh, I've got to say, as challenging as it was at times to be a teacher to my eight-year-old, my relationship with my children has improved out of sight during mm-hmm. COVID. Uh, and, and and also my relationship, by the way, with my wife. And and so for that, I remain eternally grateful. Uh, and despite the, the trials and tribulations of having been locked down, uh, especially through the second lockdown, for me, the idea of uh, giving up the, those opportunities of spending time with my family uh, is too great. And I when I left Parliament, uh, one of the things that I wrote uh, on my my Facebook, my, my um, I say my professional Facebook site at the time, which is still up, was that when I went into Parliament, I quoted my inaugural speech. I said that I would place my children and my family first, and as a result, I thought that that would make me a better legislator. But in hindsight, I didn't. I made compromises, mm-hmm. uh, and I wasn't true to that. I worked very long hours. Uh, I wanted to make sure that I gave every minute of every day to my job. And as a result, I'm not sure that I liked the person that I became. And uh, the idea that I went would go back into Parliament, Parliament would have to change significantly. For example, and I'll finish on this. When Parliament's sitting, we are required to be in Parliament. But if my child has parent-teacher interviews, or if they're competing in a sporting event or a drama or, or in an inter-school debating comment, it doesn't matter what it is. If I'm in a normal job, I can take time off. I can either seek to take leave, time in lieu or otherwise. But when Parliament's sitting, that is sacrosanct. And you, when you sign up to that, you sign up to that. So unless Parliament changes... Uh, in the way that it allows people to be part of their own family unit, I'm out. You're not going back. Well, hopefully your voice will continue to influence those that are sitting in Parliament at the moment around some of the conversations that we've had. My call to action, Div, is um, it's something that you've said, Philip, yourself, which is we are not born with bias. Bias is something that we learn. And, and I think that's a really strong statement. And if we are, if we just get really self-aware and aware of the biases that we have around us, um, call it out for each other, whether it's within your family groups, your friendship groups, in business groups, etc. And, and the, the consciousness of that, I think if we were just able to work on that, whether we're leaders, whether we're parents, whether we're community members, uh, friendships, et cetera, I think, I think it'll go a long way to changing some of the conversations that we've had around diversity and inclusion. That's my, that's my call to action. Div, to you. Beautiful. I'm going to continue on the same vein and I'm also going to steal something from Philip. Um, so you've been very profound today, Philip. Um, you said 2021 let's challenge the status quo and let's have those conversations. And I like how you put it very practically in your home, you know, at the barbecue, wherever you feel comfortable. So I I really think that's a lovely way to close our podcast because I think unless we have these conversations, um, you know, really authentically, we can't make change at all uh, in, in any sphere of influence that we have. So On that note, I'm going to warmly thank you, Philip, because you delivered and you surpassed my expectations in what we would discuss today. So that's very easy. That's very that's very easy, Div. You obviously had a low bar for me to have to jump at the beginning. (laughs) No, we we're really tough cookies to impress, and you've impressed us. An ex-politician as well. Now, come on, exactly. That was impressive. Well, well, you know what I was saying was true because I'm no longer a politician. (laughs) true you're forgiven for that you know little blip um but thank you warmly and thank you for being courageous and for being inclusive and thank you for using your voice to advocate um what i have um enjoyed the most from knowing you is the way that you give others um, confidence to have that authentic conversation. You've, you've done that for me. And I, um, when I called you yesterday to, to, you know, to check on you for this podcast, I said, you know, in the last couple of months, I've had um, 
a what will Philip do uh, question in my head when I was, you know, tentative about posting something on LinkedIn. And I remember once when you said to me, when I was starting off um, culturally diverse women, you said to me, why not? Why just go do it, try it. Why not? And I love that way about you that you just make people feel like they can have a go um, and have a conversation and no matter you know what their opinion is you can hold that space so thank you for holding that space with us today okay. it was wonderful having you and i um, i hope to continue the conversation with you sadhana and i maybe when we can meet actually face to face uh in 2021 Absolutely. I'd love that. And, and before you sign off, because I don't want people thinking that I always need the last word. Can I, can I just, can I actually turn the tables and say thank you to both of you? Because uh, it doesn't matter what I do uh, or how I do it. The fact of the matter is that the two of you are actively day in, day out, working in this space to make a difference and to see that change, to be that change. And that, uh, and that change would not occur if either of you weren't prepared to stand up. And I'll finish on this. Uh, Tony Windsor, for those of you that remember your history, was one of the independents when Julia Gillard became Prime Minister. At the time, I worked for Senator Conroy, and one of my responsibilities was looking after the crossbench. And I got to know Tony very well, and I still regard him as a bit of a friend and a mentor. or well, definitely a friend, but a bit of a mentor. Tony used to always say, the world is run by those people that turn up. So thank you for turning up. So to the two of you, thank you for turning up. Very oh, kind words. Very, thank very you. kind words. Thank, thank you, you, Philip. And for our audience, please listen and follow us for more conversations like this on Business in Colour with Div and Sarna. Thank you for listening to Business in Colour. We hope it will help you start your own discussions on diversity and inspire you to take action. We would love you to take a moment to let us know what you thought by leaving a rating and a review. The best place to find out more about our work and to connect with us personally is on LinkedIn. Until next time, stay safe and stay connected.